The Texas Longhorns head to the big house for a showdown against the defending national champions. And we're here previewing, predicting, breaking it all down as the stage is set for one of the premier matchups in college football. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Phillips. He's Cole Thompson. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications, check us out via podcast, wherever you get your podcast. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. We're brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Guys, download the Game Time app and use promo code SECU for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's game time promo code SECU to get $20 off today. The Texas Longhorns take on the Michigan Wolverines at the Big House. This is one that has been circled the entire preseason. And now, finally, we get this premier matchup in Ann Arbor, helping me break it down, preview it, predict it, everything in between. My good friend Cole Thompson joins me. And of course, guys, I'm Chris Phillips. Cole, What's going on, man? Appreciate you taking the time. Really excited to talk this one. You know, this was going to be a game that I thought we had circled as potentially a college football playoff matchup. And you want to know what? Overreactions are going to oversaturate a Monday Labor Day morning and throughout the week because it's week one. We get college football back on our television screens. We're excited that we don't have to wait around and just talk about what could have been, what the future looks like. The future has arrived. But when the future arrives, there also are the question marks. And if you are a Wolverine fan and you watched a 52 to nothing beat down in the 40 acres, you definitely felt a little bit keen this morning about what direction your team is going in. Because Davis Warren, I don't know what he's wearing on, on Saturday, but uh, it, it certainly doesn't feel like a Heisman Trophy caliber level of jersey that people are going to be looking for. And by the way, on the flip side, Gain a fighting moment for Quinn Ewers on his path to potentially make it to the Big Apple. Yeah, certainly quarterback going to be a big talking point in this one. But, Cole, let's set the stage. Again, this Saturday, September the 7th, a noon Eastern time kickoff on Fox. College game day is going to be in town in Ann Arbor at the Big House. Texas, a six-and-a-half point favorite in this game. The over-under set at 45-and-a-half in the series history. They've met one time. Texas leads at 1-0. 2005 was that meeting. Texas won that game. Thrilling fashion, 38 to 37. Like we mentioned as we talk Michigan, of course, the defending national champions, that got marred by the Connor Stallion stuff. And I watched that documentary and how riveting that was, obviously. But this Michigan team beating Fresno State 30 to 10 in the opener, Cole, I don't think that tells the whole story because this was a really competitive ball game. You don't want to overreact to week one, like you said, but. It's a different-looking Michigan team. There's no question, right? Questions at the quarterback position. Alex Orgy, Davis Warren. I didn't realize this, Cole, until I was doing my deep dive and watching some of the tape and looking at the stats. Alex Orgy with two pass attempts? Yeah. Two. Two whole pass attempts for him. Davis Warren relieves him. Who's going to be the guy under center? Donovan Edwards, obviously, Cole, we know is the star of the offense. Uh, Kalel Mullings complimented him in game one. Orgy was also active. In the running game, tight end Colston Loveland was a threat in game one for them. He was the leading receiver. We know about the defense. They're stout. They allowed Cole just nine yards rushing to Fresno State. I know it's Fresno State, but nine yards rushing allowed. Uh, Derek Moore, Mason Graham, they lead the way up front for them. Josiah Stewart, big-time impact in that first game. Five tackles, three tackles for loss, and two sacks. Uh, it's a new new look group at linebacker, although it was positive returns in week one. And then you look at that secondary. Texas will be facing off against Will Johnson, one of the best defensive backs in college football, and Makari Page returns as a veteran at the safety spot. And again, the defense was really good. It's more so questions on the offensive side. So, Cole, when you look at this Michigan team, and what I see is what I just said, really salty on defense, and they're going to have to be in this ball game as well, taking on a really potent Texas attack, because offensively, you know, I know it's one game, but this Michigan offense looks really, really one-dimensional right now. It's one-dimensional, but at the same time, I brought up this last week when talking about Texas versus Colorado State. I don't believe the Longhorns will see a more talented receiver than Torrey Horton this upcoming season. And that includes SEC talent. I, I mean, when you look at guys like Dominic Lovett, you look at guys like Trey Wilson, I think that they're all talented playmakers, but Torrey Horton is one of those players that 
maybe has the small brand, but he's a big fish in a small pot. He is the head honcho of the Mountain West. People pay attention to what he does because of they know he is going to be a playmaker on Sundays. That's how I feel about Will Johnson. You will not see a better cornerback this upcoming fall than what you see in number two that resides in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, and he was a big reason why the Wolverines gained that momentum in the second half and started to pull away from the Bulldogs. That big interception return for a touchdown is exactly the turning point that you wanted. And this is still a veteran team. Y you are going to have to replace a lot of production. And I think that we all knew that going into this year, it felt like a swan song moment for Jim Harbaugh. He wanted to go leave on his terms. He wanted to leave out uh, on top. And he did all those things. But he also took a lot of talent with him to the next level. But there's an aura about this roster that still resides in Ann Arbor that has been there for years underneath Sharon Moore, underneath the current staff. It just kind of felt like that you were making that internal promotion from CFO to CEO when the guy ends up passing away. You want to keep it in the family. You want to keep it in the business because you want auras and you want mentality to stay the same. Well, that mentality has not deteriorated. The play has maybe gone down a little bit. And of course, this is where the overreaction sets on in because if it was Fresno State, but you still have Donovan Edwards. That was a guy that was placed on the college football 25 video game for a reason. And he was a great complimentary back and also a really good starter in place of Blake Corum when he had to last year and in 2022. You still have Colson Loveland. You still have several offensive linemen that have been in the building, maybe new to starting, but they've been around the block. Mason Graham, for my money, is arguably the best defensive tackle in college football. You have Josiah Stewart, who last year started to show growth after coming on over from Coastal Carolina. It feels like that he's in his bag. He's in his element. He knows exactly what to deliver and how to deliver in bright time spots. You got a secondary that is going to be very veteran-led. You also have a linebacking core that I think fits underneath Wink Martindale. The thing that's going to be really potent about this game is who steps up, and actually proves they can be the leader in the locker room for Michigan. But at the same time, when you have a weak Martindale defense, expect the unexpected. There's going to be a lot of blitzes. There's going to be a lot of cover zero fly to your face. There's going to be a lot of moments that you, Quinn Ewers could be having to face the pressure. And unfortunately, this is the one caveat that I've got to throw in with Quinn Ewers, and I'm not the only one that said this, but he's going to make one blundering mistake in a game. We watched it against Colorado State with the interception. Let's see where that mistake comes in this matchup. The best case scenario, you get it on the opening drive, work out your kinks. That way, by the time it's the fourth quarter, you're starting to pull away rather than letting this stay a little bit too long. Let's start there, Cole, as we look at this game. You mentioned Quinn Ewers. This game is a huge opportunity for Texas, I think, in regards to a tone setter. It's a huge opportunity for both squads, by the way. I mean, Michigan, I feel like, is – they were talked about coming in this season, but sort of overlooked in the Big Ten, right? I think the Connor Stallion stuff kind of – maybe overshadowed a little bit just how good they were last year. And obviously, you lose a bunch of pieces, so many guys in the NFL. I don't know how seriously they're being taken as, you know, like a contender to win the Big Ten or even get in the playoff. I haven't seen them in many people's playoff projections. So this would be certainly a statement. But you mentioned Quinn Ewers, Cole. And the thing I hear about Quinn Ewers is, again, he doesn't really have that, that statement game. Like, has he taken over a ball game in a big-time game? And I think he's going to have the opportunity to do so. Cole, he might have to do it because my biggest concern or what I want to see from Texas, you know, Michigan on defense, like you mentioned, they're still for real. It is going to be an all-out car crash every single play in the trenches. If Quinn Ewers and when Quinn Ewers has to take over this football game, can he do it? And, and you talk to Texas folks, that's what they wanted to see this season. Their quarterback, there being times, we're seeing this at different places, but there being times where you watch a game and you say Quinn Ewers was the best player on the field that day. Do we see that in a game in the big house? Because they're probably going to need that type of performance from Quinn because, you know, we know about the questions at running back. I like Blue a ton, but if it gets to a position to where they're making you a little bit one-dimensional, you're not having as much success in the running game, which is very possible, can Quinn Ewers step up, make those big plays, and sort of have that signature game? That's what I want to see probably most from the Texas offense. See, Money, what are you talking about? Quinn Ewers was the reason they marched into the house that Nick Saban delivered at for years and was able to get the win. I mean, like, that's the standard of what you expect. Which I is want to see it more consistently. Which more is consistent. why you're now putting pressure on him to deliver at this consistent basis because, unfortunately, you also have to throw in the supporting cast. I am a big proponent that if you go see a blockbuster movie – you're going to have the leading man. That's the person that draws you into the theater. That's the reason you spend the big bucks. 
But the supporting cast is what makes or breaks the movie. You have that scene stealing moment from somebody that is supposed to be on there for like two minutes. You got somebody that comes on in that you didn't expect to be in the movie. You see somebody else that gets the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Well, the supporting cast last year down at Texas was awesome. Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell, Tavion Sanders, Jonathan Brooks. You had CJ Baxter, Jaden Blue when you needed him to step up. Gunnar Helm at times was really potent. Defensively, Tavondre Sweat. You also had in Byron Murphy. Really, really overall studious players that elevated the status of what we knew with Texas. Well, they're all gone. Every single one of them is gone, and CJ Baxter's out for the year. So you can't include him in this game. And Jaden Blue... As much as we want to see that progression, we may have to wait another week for this matchup because of what the defensive line is. The thing that you're looking for for Quinn Ewers is how do I separate myself and be that guy? Because I don't have a security blanket like Adonai Mitchell anymore. I don't have a player like Xavier Worthy that I can just say, ah, screw it. He's down there somewhere and throw it 40 yard seat. I don't have a tight end like Jatavian Sanders. I don't have that type of chemistry. I don't have that security blanket. But you got weapons. I mean, if you go back and you look at the first half of that game against Colorado State, 10 receivers caught at least one pass, and they were all for positive game. And then you got to throw in Silas Bolden, who caught a five-yard touchdown pass from Arch Manning. If he feels more comfortable in this offense, well, now you get another guy just to add to the puzzle from Ryan Wingo to Ryan Niblett to Amari Nyblack to Gunnar Helm to Isaiah Bond to Matthew Golden, who kind of got lost in translation because of he wasn't the most prominent name that was added this offseason. So you have weapons. They might right now be considered B weapons instead of A plus material weapons, but they can turn into A plus weapons. It just comes down to how quickly they adapt and build that relationship. And that's where you have a veteran quarterback. We put a lot of pressure on guys like Jackson Dart and Carson Beck because they're going into their second season with the team or their third season with the team. And you kind of sit there and go, what more do they have to learn? Quinn Ewers is in the same boat. A.J. Milwee and him have been talking for years about trying to develop an offense. There's not much more that you want to see from the development stages of Quinn. Now you just want to see the mastering. You want to be able to see those third down check downs to where you feel the blitz and you get the ball out quickly. You want to be able to see the audibles at the line of scrimmage to where he is surveying the field and has a good understanding of, okay, this is where they're targeting. This is where they're going to add the pressure. Here's how much time I have to deliver. You want to feel him actually act like that leader that can be over exceeding expectations because a lot of people believe that this could be the number one quarterback in the 2025 draft class and certainly a Heisman Trophy winner. This is one of those games that is going to separate you in that conversation where you think that you reside. And it's going to be one that I think you can put a feather in your cap for when you're trying to determine who gets into the college football playoff, especially when you have now a 12 team format and you don't know what 10 and two is going to provide a 10 and two Texas team with a win over Michigan that maybe does take a step back, but still is really promising 10, 11 wins, maybe, maybe nine wins. You, you feel okay with that if you're Quinn Ewers, and you definitely feel okay with that if you're the committee. Yeah, Cole, I'm going to say I, I wasn't trying to insinuate he's never showed up in a big game and played well. I just want to see that again. On a stage like this, I want to see Quinn Ewers, to your point, make those right decisions, lead his football team. Again, I think it's a tone setter uh, for both sides, and I, I think for Texas, we've been, again, having these questions you know, from the doubters, if you will. How are they going to fare in the SEC? I know Michigan's not an SEC team, but – you can make a statement on Saturday. I think you absolutely can set the tone for your season. Um, you know, you look at Michigan on the offensive side of the football call. I, I just wonder what they do at quarterback, like what the game plan is, especially if they're not able to consistently. And Texas's brush defense is going to be tested. That's been the big question. Interior defensive line, what does it look like? Obviously, a successful debut against Colorado State. We were really impressed. You mentioned Torrey Horton, what they did in week one against the pass game. I mean, it was – I think they passed with flying colors on the defensive side. This is a different challenge, right? The running game is going to be something they've got to account for with Donovan Edwards, the running ability, ability of Alex Orgy. I just question how is Michigan going to move the football if they cannot throw it downfield, if they cannot push it downfield. I, I, I question how they're going to do that. So, you know, I, I have – there's things I want to see from Texas defensively, but I just – you know, what what do you think Michigan does at quarterback here? I mean, that, that's my big question. There's a ton of ways that they can go. Davis Warren, you know, feels like the more complete passer, but Alex Orgy was the one that found the end zone. There's a little bit more mobility when it comes to Orgy. So I don't think that you want to have a quarterback roundabout where you're just switching in and out. You're just going like reliever style. 
But what I think you want to do is be able to figure out what tempo works for you very early on in the game. So let's just say Orji comes out and he gets the start. And you're unable to get anything on the ground moving with Donovan Edwards. You're unable to get him to move outside the pocket. So you bring in Davis Warren and you find a little bit more success. A couple of first downs and then you punt at midfield. Maybe you keep with Warren because the passing attack is taking a step further while the run game is actually taking a step back. And the part that's really going to be interesting for me is that while Texas had a great performance in coverage, their pass rush was very limited against Colorado State. Only a handful of pressures, only a handful of tackles for losses, zero sacks on the day. And this is a defensive line that does feature newcomers, but also very stable players who have been in the system underneath both uh, Johnny Nansen when he was at Arizona and also Pete Kiewitowski when he's come on over from uh, came on over to Texas. I mean, you got Baron Sorrell going into his fourth year. Yeah, you got Bill Norton. You got uh, a Tory Love. You got you got all these players. You got a, 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 a Tybee. You have all these players that you feel really confident in on the defensive line that should be taking that step forward. Trey Moore, one of the biggest names that was brought in this offseason from UTSA, uh, AAC Defensive Player of the Year. You feel good about the direction that they're going in. This is a statement where you can kind of show the rest of the SEC, hey, you can't be us through the year because we're going to take away the passing element, but you also got to make sure that you're timely when it comes to getting the ball out or running it against us because we're going to be a brick wall of oblivion that you're just going to run into, break a couple of teeth, and have to go back to the pylon and say, where the hell do we go? This is one of those games where you see it. You didn't watch the pass rush in that matchup against Colorado State. You might see it a little bit more potent and a little bit more bountiful in terms of how they like to attack a quarterback. But if you're Michigan, I think you're going to see both these guys play very early on in the game just to get a good litmus test of where they stand on how they want to build this offensive front. Cole, you mentioned the supporting cast for Quinn Ubers. I think that's going to be a fascinating matchup, the Texas wide receivers against that Michigan secondary. I mean, there's plenty of big time NFL type of matchups in this game but I mean you mentioned the freshman Ryan Wingo Isaiah Bond Jonte Cook Matthew Golden uh I mean the list just goes on and Omari Nyblack of guys that Texas has at their disposal I, I think that is going to be a lot of fun to see I mean I know again it really starts in the trenches on both sides that's where this game's going to be won and lost and that to me is a fascinating matchup because again we you know we've heard about the physicality you you mentioned the identity like they're going to be physical they're going to want to whoop that ass at the point of attack that's where they're going to want to win this football game uh i just don't see how michigan keeps up with these playmakers i, I mean it feels like i know it's a bunch of new right you're replacing a bunch of guys and i again not trying to overreact to week 1 but they've got dudes man like they replaced what they lost with big time dudes. Like I'm a big believer in Isaiah Bond and what he can be. Again, Ryan Wingo is one of the best freshman receivers in the country. Um, you know, Jonte Cook, Matthew Golden, you mentioned, you know, Silas Bolden, who I didn't even mention, who really didn't make a, you know, he had one catch for a touchdown in that ball game, but he's a big time ball player. So I mean, you mentioned the supporting cast. Quinn's got the supporting cast around him. It's just to me, can they find offensive balance against a really salty Michigan defense? And if they can, I think it's going to be really, really tough on the Wolverines to slow them down. I'm going to go ahead and play a counterpoint because if you were talking about the matchups that you want to see from this offense with Texas, Jade Barron and Andrew Makuba against Colson Loveland are going to be, I think, a chess match to watch because of that is the one caveat that comes to getting third downs, converting, and staying on the field if you're Michigan. You know that you have arguably the best tight end in the country at your disposal, regardless of who is throwing him the football. And you watched as Jaday Barron last week at a big time interception. He kind of is that interchangeable player to where if you want him at linebacker, he can play close to the line of scrimmage. You want him at the star position, he can add value in coverage. Adrian Makuba, former a ACC Rookie of the Year on defense at Clemson, comes back to the Lone Star State, and he has a pretty good performance. This is why you brought him in. You brought him in to take away the elements of over-the-top, big-time, explosive plays and your most explosive player is your tight end if you're Michigan. If you take him out of the game, if you get Jade Barron to be able to play sidestep, lock-in coverage, or Andrew Makuba, they work it upfield to where now you got to take him out and 87's not available for Ann Arbor, what direction do you go if you're Michigan? Because this is going to be a major test for their young wide receiver core taking that next step forward. And if you don't have a security blanket that you know that you can trust as a young quarterback trying to build that relationship, 
The beauty about college football and the beauty about football in general is the tight end position has become such a key element to any success. And for young quarterbacks or first time quarterbacks, you feel like that's your security blanket. You feel like that his ability to win with size, his frame, usually decent catch radius, that's going to be something that keeps moving the sticks forward. Jaday Barrett and Andrew Makuba, if they can eliminate Colson Loveland in this game, it does feel like that you are probably going to see a matchup that you don't want to overexpect. You don't want to go into this game feeling a little bit too cocky. But by the third quarter, if you have a two-touchdown lead, that might be enough the way your defense is playing. And so that's going to be something that I think that you have to look at on the opposing side. Sometimes supporting cast comes with offensive identity. But the best supporting cast for any young quarterback or any quarterback in general is a studious defense that gets the ball back to him to create scoring opportunities as much as possible. That way you turn a small league into a substantial gain and eventually put the game out of reach. To your point, Cole, if Texas can get ahead, it really feels like Michigan is going to be behind the eight ball. Like if they have to throw, um, I, I don't think that's a position they want to be in. Also, I'm really curious to see Cole again. We, you know, game one against Colorado State, did we really see it? Uh, converting in the red zone, going to be big yeah. in this game. That was something last year. Obviously, we talked about a lot over the offseason. This is the kind of game I think where you find out is that still an issue and again I know we're nitpicking here but in a game like this you nitpick everything because all those little things like you said a leak turns into a flood which can cost you a football game let's get I'll tell you one more go ahead go ahead third down attempts within two yards that is something that I'm really going to be interested in yep. because of the thing that you lost with CJ Baxter was the ability mm -hmm. to convert on short and when you have a guy like Mason Graham and Josiah Stewart that you have to pay attention to at this point, with the with the right tackle that you still are kind of breaking in opposite of Calvin Banks, that's going to be a mismatch that I think could eventually cost you a few punts and cost you a few drives. Let's see how quickly you get the running game to be able to pick up those short yardage situations. Yeah, can Texas lean on Michigan when they need to? That, that's the big question, to your point. Third and shorts, fourth and shorts, et cetera. Cole, let's make some predictions for this game. I'll let you start. Texas, Michigan, huge tone setter for both sides. This is a massive game, I think, for the Longhorns especially. Thoughts on this one? Who comes out on top? Listen, they call it the big house because it is the largest stadium in college football, but that doesn't mean it's the loudest stadium. However, this is one of those games that I think that you will see the maize and blue come out in droves early on in the morning. It'll be 5 a.m. and they're already camped out in the parking lot getting ready to experience what is going to be a game that we talk about through probably the next few weeks because of it truly is a tone setter for both these programs that still believe that they can be college football playoff, not teams, but contenders moving into 2024 and well beyond that. New era for Sharon Moore, new era for this Michigan offense. And I'm going to be completely transparent. When you look at what Michigan is and what Michigan did last week against Fresno State, take that with a grain of salt. There is something about playing against primetime opponents, especially after you get that hiccup game out of the way where you will see a deliverance. You will see a certain standard. You will see a team give the whole heart all an internal just to make sure that they separate themselves. And I think Wink Martindale is going to call up a very solid game for the first half. The problem is that I think Texas just has too many weapons on the outside to where if you don't get your first pitch to Isaiah Bond, you feel good with your slider and Amari and I black. And if the slider's not working, you can go to the curveball and Silas Bolden. If you don't have the curveball working, you can go to your forkball. That's going to be Matthew Golden. There's just so many weapons at Quinn Ewer's disposal. And the fact that he's had an entire offseason to work with most of them and Silas Bolden has really picked up the offense as quickly as he did coming on in from Oregon State. It just feels like you're going to pull away in the second half. Even if you do have a limited run game, even if you do feel like that you're allowing too many explosive plays on the ground to dive in Edwards, you're just going to have that seven-point lead as that comfort zone. I think Texas walks away with a 28-17 to win in this matchup. Ultimately, I do think this is the Silas Bowling game that we have been waiting for and one that will be a certain standard that SEC teams are going to have to prepare for. Cole, heck of a logo game here. Jersey game, uh, seeing those two iconic brands go up against each other. How could you not be excited for this one? Not just as an SEC or Big Ten fan, but a college football fan. This is going to be must-see TV. You know, I, I look at this game, and I don't want to overreact to week one either, but I, I do look at the offensive product for Michigan, and I just wonder, you know, if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks is what they say, and I just, I, I, I'm really fascinated to see 
what Michigan <clears throat> is going to do under center when it comes to Alex Orgy, Davis Warren. How do they rotate those guys? And to your point, I think early on, you get both them in, kind of figure out what you have, what's the tone of the game, how are, are you winning up front, et cetera. I do think this is going to be a tight, competitive game. And to your point, I, I just think Texas has got too much when it comes to weapons. I mean, I, I think Michigan, very good defensively. I think they'll hold their own. I think it's going to be a lower scoring game. You know, you, you look at, again, Texas, six and a half point favorite, over under 45 and a half. So I think Vegas is expecting the same thing. Bit of a lower scoring slugfest. And I agree with you, Cole. I mean, I, I think Texas... I do think Quinn Ewers makes a big throw or two. Again, you've got these weapons on the outside. You lost so much from last year, but you brought in so much as well, and you replaced him with big-time playmakers. I look for a guy like Isaiah Bond to really establish himself as that true wide receiver one, that big-time guy on the outside for Texas. Um, you know, I, I do think I, I'm excited to see the battle in the trenches, how Texas holds up. Michigan is for real up front. You mentioned, you know, the def defensive line play. They are for real up front. If and when Texas needs to lean on them, get a yard or two, get a push, are they going to be able to, especially when they get in the red zone? And Cole, I think the answer is going to be yes more often than no. I, I do think this is a fourth quarter game. I think it's a game that maybe it's even closer than the score I'm predicting. I think Texas punches one in late to extend the lead. Give me Longhorns 24, Michigan 14. And what I think will be a really big-time statement win. Again, I, I think Texas is going to come in with a chip on the shoulder wanting to prove that they've got the physicality to go in and win a game like this. It's been questioned all offseason from people about, are you SEC ready? And when they ask that question, they're asking specifically up front, especially in the interior defensive line. I think Texas takes it personally. I think they get a big-time road win. And I just – I go back to, Cole, I just don't know that Michigan's got the horses to keep up with Texas on the offensive side. That's my big question because I think if you're Texas, you sell out on stopping the run – and I think you dare Michigan to throw the ball. I, I, I just you, you dare them to throw it down the field. I think you have to do that. I think the other thing that we have to go ahead and make sure that we're clear about to any fan that's watching this, Michigan, Texas, if you're just an SEC or a Big Ten fan, season's not over after week two. Right. Like you watched that game a couple of days ago when you were looking at USC versus LSU. USC feels like that they're on top of cloud nine. Watch if they potentially lose in a couple of weeks to Michigan when they have to go ahead and face off against the Wolverines. But an LSU still has a shot to go 11 and one. So one game does not define your season. Just these early hiccups. Sometimes you want to get them out of the way before they become detrimental to your success. And it's a non-conference game as well. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't affect your overall stance on where you go heading into Atlanta or potentially Indianapolis. What this does is just hurts your radar but also, depending on how the game ends up looking at the season's end, it may be a big blessing in disguise on why you're catapulted into the dozen dance. Yeah, Cole, 12-team college football playoff. Your season's certainly not over with one loss, but most certainly a big-time tone setter for both Texas and Michigan early in this 2024 season. So, guys, let us know what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? How do you see it playing out at the big house when te Texas and Michigan do battle? Guys, appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications. Check us out via podcast wherever you get those as well. And you can find us on social media platforms, our website, secunfiltered.com. For Cole Thompson, I'm Chris Phillips. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in. And we will catch you on the other side.